thiols. In this lesson, we're going to look at naming, synthesis, and reactions of thiols, which will not take long at all, truth be told. So, uh, relatively minor functional group, both thiols and sulfides in the next lesson, uh, that we'll be able to cover all three in a single lesson for each. Uh, for many of you, you're not even going to encounter this functional group. So, if, if you guys don't have thiols and sulfides, then this lesson and the next one, uh, just ignore them, because it's not the part of, uh, of quite a few textbooks as well as quite a few curriculums for many courses throughout the country. So, if that's the case, ignore. So, but for the few of you that are getting this, uh, we're going to cover it. And like I said, we're going to cover it pretty briefly. And we'll see there's a little bit of biological relevance as well. So, Thiols. A thiol is simply just the sulfur equivalent of an alcohol. So instead of an OH, you have an SH. So, and in this case, they're named very similar to an alcohol. So, but instead of saying all as the suffix, you say thiol as the suffix. So notice if we had, you know, this three carbon alcohol here, this would be propan one all or one propanol. Well, same thing here. This is going to be propan, but since thiol is our suffix now, and thiol begins with a consonant sound, not a vowel sound, then we keep the E, and so I almost forgot to put the one in there. So propane one thiol, or once again, since the thiol is the only functional group that's part of the parent chain, then we could put the one out front as well and call it one propane thiol. Cool, so that's if you're Thiol is the highest priority function group in your molecule, but what if it's not? So like here, I've got it with an alcohol, and an alcohol has a higher priority than the thiol. And so in which case, you're going to name the thiol as a substituent, and we call it a mercapto substituent. So when you hear thio or mercapto, both of those uh, are kind of old common ways of referring to sulfur. So in what we're going to use in the IU pack in this case as well. So in this case, if we're going to name this as an alcohol for the parent chain, then we'll number it to give the alcohol the lowest possible number. And so we see we've got this mercapto substituent at carbon three. And so this is going to be three mercapto propan one all. So could have also named it three mercapto one propanol. But cool, just wanted to show one example where we also name a thiol as a substituent. All right, now we're going to take a, a quick look at synthesis. because We've got one major way of pulling this off, and that is going to be via an SN2 reaction here. And, and if I want to end up replacing my leaving group with something that's going to end up being a thiol, well, then I need to replace it with an SH group. And SH, get a strong nucleophile here, so most commonly is going to be with sodium here. So... And in this case, this is our reagent. So it turns out sulfur is one of the best nucleophiles we've got, might even be the best nucleophile we've got. And so with a negative charge, it's strong enough. And even if we just used H2S where it was neutral, it's still actually a reasonably strong nucleophile and still might pull this off, although H2S is a gas. All right, so straight up SN2. We're just gonna be doing backside attack here. Nothing fancy, nothing new. Backside attack, kick off the leaving group, and we have now formed a thiol. And like I said, this is really the only way we're going to discuss forming a thiol, which makes it easy. Let's look at the one reaction of thiols. All right, the one major reaction for thiols here is forming what we call a disulfide. And so here I'm going to use two equivalents of a single thiol here. So, and it turns out we're going to oxidize these. And it turns out they're going to dimerize when you oxidize it here. So, and we're going to form what's called a disulfide. And, and it turns out this is completely reversible. And you can add a reducing agent to undo this. So and it is this reaction that actually has a little bit of biological relevance. So your cysteine residues in, which is one of your, you know, naturally occurring amino acids, undergoes this exact process. Let's take a look. All right, so here is a cysteine residue in the middle of a larger uh, protein, which is just a peptide of uh, bonded amino acids here. And so I've kind of got these squiggly lines represent that this is one amino acid connected to a whole bunch of others in the context of a protein here. And if two cysteine residues get close together, then they might undergo an oxidation to form a disulfide here. And in this case, in biochemistry, we'd call this a disulfide bridge. And these disulfide bridges, it turns out, pay... Uh, are really important when it comes to uh, the structure of peptides and stuff like this. In fact, uh, your hair has these lovely disulfide bridges as well. And it used to be back in the day for those that had hair, uh, 
that they might get what's called a permanent or simply a perm. And I realize those are kind of round a little bit, but much more common back when I was a kid. A lot of ladies got perms and even a few men out there. So, but these permanents, what they'd actually do is they'd take your hair and they would apply a reducing agent. So, and your hair is a protein. So, and the reducing agent would break all of these disulfide bonds. So allowing the proteins in your hair to kind of uh, adopt a, a more relaxed conformation, if you will. And then they would shape your hair and stuff like that. And then they would add an oxidizing agent back, which would form new disulfide bonds that would lock your hair kind of into that position. So, and as long as you didn't add another reducing agent, it was locked into that. You could wash your hair and it would still, you know, kind of go back to that kind of uh, exact shape, that perm or permanent that you'd got. So that's kind of your biological relevance. And again, these disulfide bridges, again, really important for the structure of proteins. And, and again, this could be a single protein. These might, you know, be connected and a part of a single peptide structure, or it could actually be two separate peptides that actually end up bonded together in one of these disulfide bridges. So both uh, examples of both do exist in nature. If you found this lesson helpful, would you consider giving me a like and a share? It's the best way you can guarantee that other students are going to see this lesson. If you're looking for the study guide that goes with this lesson, if you're looking for practice problems, if you're looking for practice final exams or final exam reviews, check out my premium course on chadsprep.com.